The Bristol Motor Speedway in eastern Tennessee, one of NASCAR's most famous tracks, and tonight hosting some of its most famous personalities in a very special event. This racetrack's been around since 1961 in the hills of East Tennessee. It's changed a lot over the years, growing with the sport's growth. But some of those who helped write some of the important chapters in stock car racing's history have come back for a special race on a Saturday night. ESPN, the world's leader in motorsports coverage, presents... of the new millennium is moments away. ESPN welcomes you to the Saturday Night Showdown at Bristol. A race for fun, to benefit charity, with some of Stock Car Racing's all-time greats climbing back behind the wheel. Twelve drivers accounting for 244 major stock car wins have come back to Bristol Motor Speedway, a place where they've created so much history, names any longtime fan of stock car racing knows by heart. While most have been long retired from competitive action, they're here to feel the thrill of the fight and bask in the spotlight at one of the sport's great venues. And make no mistake, they all intend on taking home the trophy at the end of the night. And down here in the middle of this great concrete coliseum, I'm Alan Bestwick. Thanks for joining us for our Saturday night showdown at Bristol. With the possible exception of Brett Favre, when high-level athletes retire from competition in their sport, it's rare to see them back on the field of play. Imagine watching Hank Aaron or Willie Mays walk up into the batter's box or Terry Bradshaw or the Steel Curtain defense go out onto the football field once more. Well, that's going to happen right now as 12 drivers who've written so much stock car racing history climb back behind the wheel here at one of the sport's great venues. Yes, they're racing to raise money for charity. Yes, they're here to have fun. But I can tell you now what separates this from other old-timers days is that they're going to do it at over 100 miles an hour. And by the way, I'm glad they're not too close to me to hear me say Old Timers Day because I'd probably get slugged. The schedule for the day, a couple of minutes behind schedule because the Nationwide Series race of earlier has run a little bit overtime. So the drivers going out onto the racetrack now just to get their first few minutes of warm-ups in these cars that they'll run here today. Then they'll bring them down pit road, introduce them to the uh, crowd that's here, and then turn them loose for 35 laps here on the world's fastest half mile. Some of the color schemes longtime fans of NASCAR will well recognize as these drivers head out for some warm-up laps. These cars that they're running are not cars that they've brought with them. These are cars that the Bristol Motor Speedway has put together that normally run on the USAR Pro Cup Series. There's David Pearson, the Silver Fox, and boy, what a familiar paint scheme that is to longtime fans of NASCAR racing. Pearson getting ready to go. He was supposed to run this race a year ago, was not able to be in it because of a little back problem. But he's back here today, and he's looking for a trophy here at Bristol. Still waiting to head out onto the racetrack. Cale Yarborough, one of the all-time greats of the sport. And for more on the story of Cale Yarborough and, boy, his many accomplishments here at Bristol, let's get out of Pit Road and Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, Alan Cale Yarborough is tied for second all-time with wins here at Bristol Motor Speedway. Nine victories, tying Dale Earnhardt Sr. and Rusty Wallace. When I talked to Cale a moment ago, as they were buckling me in the car, he was smiling from ear to ear. He said, Doc, it's just like I've never left. I'm excited to get back in the car. I want to get on the racetrack, and I want to be in victory lane for win number 10 when this day is over. These guys are serious about getting back on the track and reliving some great memories here of NASCAR at Bristol so much attention last fall when Jimmy Johnson was about to break his record for consecutive championships in stock car racing and he was in this race a year ago and he came out of it with a huge smile and, and Kale said last fall when so many people were talking to him he said I want to do it again well he's here tonight and about to head out onto the racetrack for some warm up laps we mentioned last year's race the drivers went at it last year in a similar event 35 laps here on the Bristol half mile some of the racing cars that they had prepared and brought themselves some in cars that others had prepared it was quite a night here at Bristol one year ago. We're going to watch some drivers whose legendary careers span some five decades climb back in a race car. You got to sit back in your house, pull your seatbelts down, and get ready for a shootout. Green flag. Rusty Wallace making a move inside. Rusty's headed toward the front. Here comes 
L. D. Ottinger now getting racing. I guess you never forget about how to ride a bicycle or drive a race car. But L. D. Ottinger's getting it done. And Sterling Marlin has led from the drop of the green flag. Comes back in a legends race and wins it at Bristol. Live back at Bristol Motor Speedway, getting ready for the Saturday night showdown at Bristol. A couple of final warm-up laps on doing for some of the 12 legends who are going to run 35 laps here tonight. Let's hear from some of them who've already finished their warm-ups. Vince Welch is standing by. Vince, who you got? With Larry Pearson, a two-time Nationwide Series champion. He won a couple of races here at Bristol. And, uh, Larry, you went out for some practice laps. How did it feel to be back out in the car here? Oh, it felt great. I, uh, I got a really good car. And... Uh, it's a little on the tight side, but I'm, I'm, I'm sort of scared to mess with it right now. Uh, I made that mistake last year. Is that the car or the driver that was a little on the tight side? Excuse me? The car or the driver was a little on the tight side. <laughs> well, the driver's been tight all day. But uh, no, the car's just a little on the tight side in one end. I'm good down here in three and four, but down in one and two, it's a little tight. But uh, I want to take this opportunity to uh, thank Swisher uh, International for uh, coming on board with me again this year and uh, hopefully we'll get him a lot of exposure. We mentioned that you'd won a couple of times here at Bristol. What's a moment that stands out specifically for you? Uh, honestly, it was, uh, wasn't when I won, uh, but the time that I, uh, probably 80, 85, 86, maybe, maybe 87. I don't really know, it's too, too long ago, but uh, me and Dale Earnhardt, when uh, he was driving the old Chevy, uh, Chevy two, I think he had, uh, me and him battled most of the race, and that was a lot of fun, but uh, I've always loved coming to Bristol. It's it's a great track. I've always ran really, really well here. I only have two wins, but I should have a lot more. But, uh, you know, it's, it's just a, a lot of fun to come back, and I really appreciate uh, Bristol Motor Speedway for, for putting this on for us and, and letting us come back up and, and race. Thanks, Larry. Great to see you. Larry Pearson. Let's go to Jamie Little. And Rick Wilson, another one of those legends. He's had a couple laps out there already, working up the sweat in the car right now, but he too has some great memories here. Back in 1989, he won his first nationwide series, what was then the Bush series, from the pole. What a day that must have been. What was that day like for you back in 1989? Well, it was one of them days that just, you know, were kind of unreal. Uh, the car was so great. I mean, about anywhere we could go, the Charlie Henderson, the Food Country Gang, gave me a great car that day. And, you know, it's just one of those days you look back and say, boy, that was a perfect race car. Well, Rick, I got to ask you, I see the sweat building up on your face. You've been out there a couple laps. What was it like? Oh, I tell you what, it's great to be back here at Bristol. First time I've been here since they redid the track. And, uh, hey, it's a, it's still a great race track. Got a great race car. Food country car is going to be good today. Hey, have a great time. Rick Wilson in the 75 car. It doesn't matter whether you're Duck. Let's see if you know who this is in this car here. Now, we're going to give you a shot of the shoes. Now, driving, there's the floorboard, and he is wearing wingtips. Who was it always drove wearing wingtips and that coveted Goodyear hat? Well, none other than Dave Marcus, and the 69-year-old Wausau, Wisconsin driver is back in the car, and he has turned some pretty quick laps. Dave, uh, how's it feel to be back in a race car? Feels really good. I mean, <laughs> better than I thought. <laughs> You get up to speed pretty quickly. You think you got a good shot at uh, pulling this one off? Well, I mean, you never know, Jerry. Uh, yeah, a lot of us haven't driven in a long time. I mean, I haven't uh, driven since I retired. Of course, I've done IROC cars up till the uh, fall of 06. But um, the car feels good, and I feel comfortable in it. And, uh, you know, I got it up to speed pretty quick. I'm happy with it. And, and you got him. You're one of the youngest guys in the field at 69. Is that right? Well, maybe that's an advantage, huh? <laughs> hey, have some fun, Dave. All right. Thank you, Jerry. And I want to say hi to everybody at Camp 28 in Rib Lake. All right. Dave Marcus coming down. He's retired up in Wisconsin running a hunting camp. Let's go to Alan Beswick. All right, Doc, thanks. I'll tell you, you were talking about Dave getting out there up to speed in practice. Some of these two guys went out in just a couple laps. They were running in the pack, and you could see those competitive juices flowing. I think this is going to be an awful lot of fun to watch this Saturday night showdown in a couple of minutes. So, again, they've just finished some warm-ups, giving the drivers a couple of minutes to get their thoughts together, do the driver introductions, and then they're going to turn them loose for 35 laps, and the men will call the action for us upstairs. Marty Reed with Dale Jarrett and Rusty Wallace, gentlemen. All right, thank you, Alan. And uh, I don't know if you can see a timing monitor, but listen to some of these times. Fastest in the brief practice, Harry Gant at 118 miles an hour. That's 16.2 seconds. That's 
flying. Yeah, if you look at Harry Gant, though, this day, I swear he could get back in a nationwide car or a cup car and get the job done. Well, you're exactly right. These guys haven't lost a touch. I mean, you talk about the speed that Harry just run right there, 1620. That was the same speed as the last five laps of the nationwide race we just saw a little while ago. So he jumped in this car, and he just fast right off the bat. Phil Parsons was second at 117 miles an hour. L.D. Ottinger, he ran really well here last year. He's going to be a, a factor in this, I think, as well. And there's Harry at age 70 behind the wheel of the familiar green and white 33. Yeah, and one of the great short track racers of all time, Jack Ingram there in that 11 car. You better watch out for him. He still knows how to get it done. Well, let's uh, also talk about some of the legends of the sport. David Pearson got out there as well. He was ninth fastest on the charts, and uh, we mentioned he was not able to run uh, the race last year, and who can forget the fact that the Silver Fox and Richard Petty had all those wonderful battles. In fact, I've always said if a guy by the name of Richard Petty had never been born, we'd be calling David Pearson the king. Let's go to Vince. Uh, what a terrific, uh, a true legend indeed. Three-time cup champion, 105 cup wins, second all-time. And uh, David, glad that you could be in the race this season. We're talking about some of the uh, practice laps you turned there. How is this car different or something maybe that's a little different than you're not used to? <laughs> it's a lot different, to tell you the truth. Of course, I'm having trouble with the clutch. The clutch is not releasing like it ought to be. And uh, it's got a left foot brake, and I am no left foot driver. You know, I, I can't use the brakes uh, with my left foot and uh, of course when I try to cruise my right foot away over there on that side uh, I hit the throttle coming back so I, I can't find the throttle so it just takes time for me to get used to it. Those things aside how's it feel to be back in a race car at Bristol? Oh it feels good as far as that goes come back and, and the car runs real good it runs great I just uh, got to get used to the car and you know and get used to the handling of it. David Pearson indeed boy they te termed it right when they said legend in reference to this gentleman. Guys? Doc. And how about a guy who uh, we told you, he's already told you he won nine times at Bristol. He is the only driver to ever lead every single lap at Bristol Motor Speedway. Kelly Yarbrough, you led all 500 laps here in one of your nine wins. Uh, how's it feel to be back in the car? Well, it feels good. I've always loved, uh, loved Bristol, but you know, doing something one time a year doesn't make you very good at it, but we're just out here to have fun and uh, Really good to be back and see a lot of fans, see a lot of these old guys that I've raced with all my years, so just a lot of fun. What did you do to get get in shape to get back in the car? I know you do a lot of work outside, but what, how about physically? What did you do to prepare for this day? I didn't do anything to, especially to prepare for it. When it's over with, I may wish I had. <laughs> hey, good luck to you. Thank you. Folks, Kel Yarber will be 72 years old next week, Alan, and he is smiling ear to ear. You can see him in the car. He's ready to rock and roll once again to Bristol. It is so fun, Doc, to hear his voice inside that helmet talking about this race. Kale Yarbrough, one of the 12 legends, getting ready to go in the Saturday night showdown at Bristol. They're getting them ready. We're going to turn them loose in a little while for 35 laps on the world's fastest half mile. I think it's going to be a scream. Back at Bristol Motor Speedway in Thunder Valley, one of NASCAR's great venues where tonight a number of stock car racing's great drivers are ready to run the Saturday night showdown. Twelve drivers going to run 35 laps. The race benefits charity. But most of all, it just gets us a chance to see some of the sport's all-time greats climb back behind the wheel once again. One of those greats is with Jamie Little. He's definitely one of the original journeymen of what is now called the Nationwide Series. Tommy Houston, what a run he had in this very series, helping to put it on the map. We're going to show a little bit of that racing action. His guy's excited running over the wall. We're showing some of the footage of one of your wins, Tommy. What is one of the best memories you have here at Bristol? Well, I, I, I've had a lot of good memories here. I, I remember when the track was really rough and we ran real well. And I remember when we led a lot of the race and uh, Mark Martin thought the race was over with and pulled in that time. And, David Green won the race, and we ran second. But, uh, you know, I've got a lot of really, really good memories. Uh, you know, I come here when it wasn't, it wasn't nothing except a concrete grandstand, and that was it. So I'm happy to be here. These guys came out last year and had a lot of fun, Tommy. What made you come out this time around? Well, like I say, Wayne invited me, and I, I was really proud that he did. And, uh, you know... I've got a sponsor, Jewelry Exchange, on the car and, and for the car, and 
Then Jack McNally and all his guys, uh, they've really been so nice to furnish a car, so I'm going to try to do them proud today. All right. Well, you have fun. Go fast, and thank you for all you've done in this Nationwide Series. He'll be in the number six car. Alan? So much fun to hear Tommy Houston as well getting ready to go here at Bristol today. Have seen that man race thousands of laps. Great gentleman, a great racer, and uh, glad to have him here in the Saturday Night Showdown. So we're getting ready for the uh, Command of Fire engine shortly, and then we're going to have the green flag and see the stock car racing legends out at Bristol for 35 laps of fun. That is when we come back to Thunder Valley. Get ready with the Saturday Night Showdown here at Bristol Motor Speedway. 12 stock car racing greats are strapped aboard their machines. This is a legendary track, and one of the men who founded it is going to give the command to start engines to get these legends underway. Out of Timmonsville, race South fans, Carolina, gentlemen, here, three-time NASCAR this is Cup Carl Series Moore, champion, K.O. Yarbrough. Race, Carl. Car number 21 out of Spartanburg, North get Spartanburg, well, Jeff. Jeff North South Carolina, Carolina going off in the ninth position. And the Jeff mentioned, Jeff Bird, track president, who is uh, recuperating, uh, dealing with an illness, and this race is brainchild, and we certainly look forward to seeing Jeff back here with us for next year's running of the Saturday Night Showdown. So the engines have fired, the cars are rolling off onto the racetrack, and that can only mean one thing. It's about time to go racing. Let's go upstairs to Marty Reed, Dale Jarrett, and Rusty Wallace. Gentlemen, this should be fun. Yes, it should, Alan. And let's explain how these gentlemen uh, obtained their positions on the grid. For example, L.D. Ottinger is going to be on the pole. It is thanks to the courtesy of Justin Allgaier winning the race. That's right. There were certain drivers in the race earlier today. For example, Jimmy Hensley had Brad Keselowski. Keselowski finished second, so Hensley starts second. Kyle Busch finishes uh, in the, the top field and uh, third, and so Jack Ingram is third. So that gives you an idea. There is your starting lineup with Tommy Houston, Dave Marcus, Harry Gant, Charlie Gottsback, Rick Wilson, Larry Pearson, Cale Yarborough, David Pearson, and Phil Parsons. Let's uh, dial up our in race reporter it's handsome harry gant harry gant rusty wallace up here in the espn booth you got us I got you loud and clear. harry it's been a long time since you've been here and this racetrack's brand new since you drove it what's it feel like out there it feels pretty good so far only got to run five laps all right buddy you have a great race out there we'll be pulling for you appreciate it. we should point out we do have one to the rear Jimmy Hensley, uh, actually they changed cars and since he was not uh, that familiar with it, he is scheduled to be in the number seven. He is now in the number 68. So he's gonna pull to the rear of the field. Uh, other than that, everybody is there is Jimmy. And uh, so he'll pull to the back of the field as we get ready for 35 laps of racing and green flag racing at that. Yellows will not count. Hey, well, how cool do these cars look? They've got these things painted up like these guys drove in their heyday and uh, really good looking race cars. About 200 pounds heavier than last year's cars that they drove, which were late model stocks. These are uh, Pro Cup cars from the Hooters Pro Cup series. And what the guys are trying to do now is form up into a four wide salute to the fans. And that's a pretty cool deal. That is pretty cool deal. They gotta be careful doing that. So <laughs> good luck with that. That's pretty tight. Uh, <laughs> Pretty tight quarters out there to try something like that. Looks like they're going to pull it off, though. We won't be giving them any ideas here for four wide racing. They see that it is possible to get four wide on here. They don't need to do that at speed. I think they all understand that. The youngest in the field is Phil Parsons at the age of 52. And uh, the oldest, Jack Ingram, at the age of, no, David Pearson, I should say, at the age of 75, Jack, you, 73. One thing I've noticed about these guys talking to them earlier is that they really, you know, they all say we're here to put a show on, but I will promise you, Dale, they was, these guys all want to win. I know L.G. Adams was strong, you know, Jack Ingram, Harry Gant, and we saw that real fast lap earlier out of Harry Gant, 1620, very fast lap. Hey, they might be older now, but they haven't lost that competitive spirit. And when they get in these race cars, they want to go as fast as they can make the car go. All right, we've got an onboard camera with uh, Harry as our in-race reporter, and there he is with no gloves. <laughs> that's a NASCAR violation well, uh, these days. Open face helmet, that's what they used to drive, the bubble goggles. Uh, hey, we both drove those type of helmets before in the past, that's for sure. And well, you're bringing right. back a lot of memories here. He hasn't aged a bit. Look at him. 
I'm telling you, if you'd walk up to him on the street, you'd say, my gosh, this, this is back when Harry Gant was winning races in the late 80s and early 90s in the Cup Series. 70 years old. We mentioned the fact these cars are 200 pounds heavier, 150 more horsepower than last year's car, but they are running a different tire than uh, they're running a BF Goodrich tire instead of what we would normally see in NASCAR with a Goodyear. Yeah, and I watched one of these races with the BF Goodrich is here a couple years ago, and the tires really stuck good. They were fast. They run all day long, over 200 laps. So they're on a really good tire, and they got really aerodynamic cars. And like you said, I mean, they, they things are really prepared well and, and fast cars. Two more pace laps, and then we will go green for 35 green flag laps here on the world's fastest half mile as uh, the man behind the wheel of the pace car, Junior Johnson. There he is. That's really cool. The, cool, the car's pretty cool, too. That's yeah, a, that beautiful. Ford Sunliner, uh, that, that was a gorgeous. great car. Dale, I think one thing I'm a little concerned about is for David Pearson. I mean, a lot of guys are left foot breakers and right foot breakers. This particular car he's driving, he was just telling us, it looks like it's set up for left foot braking, and that's going to give him a problem. Yeah, if you haven't done that, and a lot of cars that are built this day and time, unless you build them another way, are built for drivers to, to use that left foot. But most of these guys came up through racing using just one foot on the brake and the gas. We mentioned Junior Johnson driving the pace car. He raced in this event last year up on the tower, who will be waving the green flag, will be a four-time Bristol winner. There he is, Bobby Allison. And that guy right there was my mentor. He taught me a lot about racing. Used to race in Birmingham, Alabama, go to his race shops, and he was one of the guys, first guys to invent the front steer steering system on these race cars. He's a real innovator. 84 career wins. A legend in the sport and a bunch of legends out on the racetrack. And there is the trophy that goes to the winner here at the end of 35 laps. Sit back and enjoy, folks. Relive some of your favorite memories as it is L.D. Ottinger bringing them down on the inside of the front row with the number six of Tommy Houston right alongside. And we're green at Bristol. Boy, and L.D. says, see ya, fellas. And I tell you, we talked last year, if you watched, happened to watch the race, of how fast he was as he got more used to driving these cars around this racetrack. This race last year, I finished second, and LD was really running me down big time. In fact, a couple more laps, I was going to get past. But this guy is really good here at Bristol, the old racetrack, and a lot of these guys are just until, hey, pass off a of turn two. Jack Ingram sticking his nose in there trying to pass Tommy Houston. And well, that's been said a lot of time. <laughs> and Harry Gant in the 33 right behind him there. And right now, it's a battle for second spot because LD has checked out. I thought Harry was going to try to make that top side. Here comes Rick Wilson up on the top trying to pass Harry Gant. Now, Harry Gant in his past career has always been known to run on the top side of the racetrack. Gets a lot of momentum up there. And Harry's going to stay in the top, it looks like, and try to make it work. Harry in the 33. The 11 is Jack Ingram. The six car forces Tommy Houston. Then a little bit further back, you can see the 75. That's Rick Wilson as he's trying to work his way up. Also the 71 of Dave Marcus and the 66 of Phil Parsons. I think LD slowed down a little, let these boys catch up. He wants to race. He's not here just to go out and run laps, 35 laps around here. He wants to race a little bit. I know these guys are running tight right now. They're just really feeling their cars out. I mean, it's going to take a little bit. It's going to take 10 or 15 laps because like Harry Gant said, he only had five laps of practice in this car. Yeah, well, LD better get on it now because Harry's liking that high groove. Yeah, remember. Here he comes with yeah, Wilson. He's got the outside line, and he's going for the pass. And here he is on the high side. And Harry Gant, the oldest winner in Sprint Cup Series history, takes the lead. And all of a sudden, LD has drifted back to third. The second is Rick Wilson. Now, Rick's won here before. He's been strong at this racetrack in the past. And he wants this win bad. And see if he's going to try to top of the track. Harry's guarding him up there. Harry was 52 years, seven months, and six days old when he won in Michigan in August of 92, the oldest Sprint Cup race winner. A little bit behind these guys, Jack Ingram finally did get around the six of Tommy Houston. You see Larry Pearson coming yeah. on the inside there. I raced a lot against Larry Pearson coming up through in the Bush Series. See the Silver Fox, David Pearson right there in 17th. We talked earlier about the problem with the break, but here's a pass for the lead, Rick Wilson. And Wilson is going to take over the top spot as we have had now 10 green flag laps under our belt here at Bristol. And these guys are running some very good speeds. I mean, 117 miles an hour for the last lap. 
watching lap times around, like you said, 16.30. Oh, tough break for Cale Yarborough. He's, he has an uh, engine smoke, and uh, they are bringing him into pit road. So uh, Cale will likely not finish as the window net comes down. Tough break. Oh, man, I hate to see that. I really want to see Cale run. I mean, he wanted to win this thing bad, that's for sure. See Phil Parsons there trying to get around L.D. Ottinger. They get battled a lot in the, the Bush series back in the 80s. I'll tell you what, <laughs> Dale, it's hard to call this race because I, I find myself just watching it because I, I appreciate what these guys are doing. And it was so much fun racing them when you and I were able to do that with them. Well, let's get an update on what happened to Cale Yarborough, Doc. Kel Yarborough said as he, when they dropped, waved the green flag, the thing began to tighten up, and he got harder and harder, and it got tighter and tighter. And obviously, these cars are owned by regular pro cup drivers, so he didn't want to take a chance on having the engine come apart. So he just backed it down here and came down pit road. A tough break for a driver who was so excited to be back here and maybe get win number 10 at Bristol. L.D. Ottinger in third, and right behind him, Phil Parsons in fourth. As you see on the right side of your screen, Cale getting ready to climb out of the car. Especially what I think you're talking about just watching these guys. What's well, really cool, we kind of grew up, we're at an age that we grew up watching a lot of these guys race, and then we had the opportunity to race with a lot of the guys. I think we finally figured out we raced with and against each one except for Charlie Glotzbach. And we've got a caution flag flying as we have debris on the racetrack. And uh, I got to tell you, two laps ago, Rick Wilson ran 120 miles an hour in that 75 car. The two-time winner in the Nationwide Series, including one win at Bristol, another at Dover, is out in front once again. Here's the pass that put him into the lead as he went underneath Harry Gant. Stay with us. We still got a lot more fun from here at Bristol Motor Speedway. The legends have returned to Bristol Motor Speedway. The Saturday night showdown at Bristol and the leaderboard, Rick Wilson, our leader, Harry Gant, L.D. Ottinger, Phil Parsons, and Jack Ingram, the top five. And Kel Yarborough having to climb out of the car. Kel, I haven't seen you smile that much in a long time. Well, I was having a good time. Uh, these boys had a new car here, and uh, they had some engine problems back in the week when they were testing it, but we had more engine problems today. Never did run right, but I was having a good time. Kel Yarborough, a nine-time winner out of it as we go back to green. Guys? And it's Rick Wilson in the 75 on point with Phil Parsons right behind him. And Parsons going to get around the 33 of Harry Gant, take over second spot on the restart. And the boys just did their first double file restart, I think, in history, too. <laughs> sure did. <laughs> Only yeah. took some of them age 75 to get to experience that moment. Yeah, and it shows Rick Wilson was paying attention in our nationwide race. He chose that outside to restart in. We saw him during the race standing up outside the racetrack. David Pearson and Rick Wilson and all the drivers really watching this race. The nationwide race had just finished. They learned a lot from that. That's David Pearson in the 17, and he gets uh, into the position now, moves ahead of Dave Marcus, and, uh, or, uh, yeah, may move him into the eighth spot. And uh, something wrong now with Harry Gant's car. Yeah, it looks like Harry's having some problems. Looks like you can hear it cutting out right there. Boy, a tough break for Harry. He was the quickest in the abbreviated practice session that the guys had. And you can see he has now been passed by the six car of Tommy Houston. So that would put him back in about 11th position. You saw him reach up and try to switch the ignition switches to get the thing fired back up. So he's definitely got ignition problem with that 33 car. He, he can still mess with it and try to get it going before it gets lapped here by Rick Wilson, who's running him down hard right now. Wilson at age 57 in front of the youngest in the field, the 52-year-old Phil Parsons. A little bit further back, as you can see, that's Charlie Glotzbach in the number three. And Charlie, the only guy in this field that neither one of you had ever raced against. Yeah, yeah. I, never, I never have. Have you? No, no. sure didn't. No, he was a little bit before, before our time, I guess, but great competitor. I remember watching him race. There's his uh, second place runs at Daytona back in 69 and 72. We can tell you that uh, Harry Gann has made it back to pit road. So it looks like his day is unfortunately over as we are working uh, on the 24th of 
35 laps and the Silver Fox continues to work his way towards the front. He is now running in seventh position ahead of Dave Marcus and Charlie Galatzbach is slowing on the racetrack. So that will give him another position. Charlie was running fourth. I don't know what's going on. But it looks like some of these guys just keep having engine problems with these cars. They're running awful fast. I mean, if you're a racer, you pay attention to lap times, really not miles per hour. These guys are down in a 15 second bracket. That's faster than nationwide cars just finished. Let's go back and take another look. Well, keep an eye on the three. Whoa. Oh, there's our problem. There we yeah. go. First uh, contact with the safer barrier. And there's the stripe on the right side to attest to it. Charlie can see I hit the wall. It wasn't hard as it used to be a long time ago. I noticed that. <laughs> I have a feeling he isn't going to say that. Whoa-oh, piece of debris out on the track. And that'll give us another caution. And remember, the caution laps do not count. So we'll have 10 laps to go when we go back to green flag racing. So it is still Rick Wilson in front of Phil Parsons, L. D. Ottinger in third, now Jack Ingram fourth, and Larry Pearson rounding out your top five as the day is over for Charlie Glassback and Harry Gantz. Stay with us. ESPN's your NBA destination. First at 8 Eastern, it is San Antonio and Atlanta. Then at 10.30 Eastern, Trailblazers take on the Suns. The NBA Special Edition on ESPN and ESPN360.com. And that's all tomorrow. Our aerial coverage brought to you by DirecTV. You can learn how to win a million dollars by just going to directtv.com slash NASCAR. And as we get ready to go back to green flag racing, we can tell you that Charlie Glotzbach did get back out onto the racetrack. So he is a couple of laps down, but uh, going to continue. It is Rick Wilson, Phil Parsons, L.D. Onger, Jack Ingram, Larry Pearson, and Dave Marcus. That's your top six, followed by David Pearson, Tommy Houston, Jimmy Hensley, Charlie Glotzbach, the cars that are still on the track. And we're back to green flag racing with 10 laps to go. Rick Wilson is flat, been getting through that gearbox. He out just he did a big jump on Phil Parsons that time. Well, the, the guy I'm still amazed with as we look back a little bit further in the field and you can see Jack Ingram as he is uh, duking it out with Larry Pearson. That's a little bit further back as a uh, battle for fourth continues. The guy right in front of him, L.D. Ottinger, age 71, proved that last year was no fluke. He's running third. Look at him there. These guys haven't lost much at all. They really haven't. I mean, uh, I know I'm harping on these lap times, but that's how I'm judging how they're running, and they're really laying some big laps down. He almost uh, hit it. What was he third last year? LD was, and this is a, a race he wanted to get back to and run real bad. So he's doing a great job out there. See his best finish here at Bristol, a second place. Uh, we've caught up with Harry Gant, Dave Burns. I think you got him. Yeah, Marty. Pretty obvious he had a great car before the motor went south there, Harry. How good was that car? It was real good, Bertie and the guys. They done a super job on this thing. It, it was great. I was saving the right rear a little bit, running a little, a little loose. And it was definitely the power plant, right? Definitely the power plant, right? Oh yeah, it, it broke a valve spring or a couple of them, I think maybe, maybe on the restart because it, it felt like it got a little weaker right before that. Thanks, Harry. Did you hear him, Marty? He was saving it. He had something left. Oh, I'll tell you, it, it, this is so much fun. Uh, uh, bad news oh, for Dave Marcus Larry fans. Pearson. Oh no, and Larry Pearson is going to slam the wall as he turns it around. Oh! oh. And Charlie Glotzbach t-bones him. Red flag is immediately displayed at start finish. A wicked hit right on the driver's side door. And we will wait and hope for the best here because that is a the worst possible spot to get hit in one of these cars. And they need the ambulance. You can see these guys waving. All right, folks, this, this all the fun is just uh, the balloon has burst a little bit for all of us. Think positive thoughts. Don't want any injuries in this deal. So Larry, the 56-year-old from Spartanburg, South Carolina, will get an update from medical officials as soon as possible. For right now, we'll just step aside and, as I said, think good thoughts.
Back here at our Saturday night showdown at Bristol Motor Speedway and what has been a wonderful evening right now all of a sudden has taken a very serious turn after a uh, turn two crash involving Charlie Glotzbach and Larry Pearson. Medical workers are still working on the 21 car that Larry was driving and we have no word yet from officials as far as uh, his condition so we will not speculate what we will do is take one more break and come back here to Bristol. All right, back here at Bristol Motor Speedway at our Saturday night showdown where with uh, about four laps remaining, we are under a red flag condition after a uh, very violent two-car crash. And there is Charlie Glotzbach as he has climbed out of his car. And uh, Charlie, at the age of 71, from Edwardsville, Indiana, being assisted over to the medical care unit. And uh, it's good to see that uh, he is walking with some assistance, but... Uh, getting some oxygen there. And there you see in the distance, uh, the crews working on the 21 of Larry Pearson. We still do not have any word from medical officials. So uh, unfortunately, there's nothing we can tell you right now other than that they are working at extricating Larry Pearson. Stay with us. Back here at uh, Bristol Motor Speedway, we continue under our red flag situation after a, a very violent two-car crash involving Charlie Glotzbach and Larry Pearson. We can tell you in our Saturday Night Showdown uh, that Charlie Glotzbach uh, did walk with some assistance, but he is uh, on his way to the infield care center to be checked out. But uh, to get more on uh, Larry Pearson's uh, situation, let's bring in uh, the man who knows the most of all of us, and that's for sure, is uh, Dr. Jerry Punch. Doc? Well, guys, you hate to have to report when you're a medical doctor or when you're a trauma doc to see these things happen at the racetrack. And uh, as you see what's happening, uh, what they're trying to, the big orange board they're using, that is a backboard. And they've been very, very deliberate and very careful to pull some of these uh, roll bars and pipes away uh, to be able to get the board underneath Larry Pearson and be able to strap him with that board and pull him straight up out of the race car. You don't want to bend him. You don't want to move him. You see them putting him on that backboard. They have a, an oxygen bag and a mask on him, and so he, uh, uh, he would, uh, would put, him, put him on the backboard and put him in an ambulance and take him out. His brother, Ricky Pearson, his brothers, Ricky Pearson and Eddie Pearson are there. Uh, they have sent someone over to talk to his dad, David, uh, and let him know what's going on, uh, but uh, they have been able to get now Larry Pearson out of the car. We'll put him in an ambulance and take him to a nearby medical center, probably in Johnson City. So uh, they are being very deliberate, which is what they should be and again the reason it's taking so long is because the car did uh, the roll in the old days these roll cages did were very very close to the driver and you want to make sure you pull the driver pull the bars away from the driver and free up the legs in the lower part of the roll cage because it was a very violent impact there in the driver's door doc has anybody given you any indication of uh, his, his medical condition at, at any point here uh, they have not so far, and I, I've seen uh, them come over and talk to Eddie Pearson and uh, Ricky Pearson, the two brothers uh, who are standing there, and uh, they have sent for a car so they can go uh, so they can go to the medical center to, to meet the ambulance when it arrives there uh, as soon as it leaves here in just a few minutes. So, All right. Thanks for the update, Doc, and I know you'll pass along any further information that you get from down there on the scene. And as we said, folks, uh, just keep thinking positive thoughts. We will pass along anything that we can get to, before we go off the air and before the end of this event. Back here at Bristol Motor Speedway, our red flag con situation continues, and we have just uh, had word from Dr. Jerry Punch. He has an update on the condition of injured driver Larry Pearson. Doc? And Marty, I just spoke with Ricky Pearson, who is the uh, brother for Larry Pearson. Ricky told me he talked to Larry. He said Larry was knocked unconscious. The accident, the impact rendered him unconscious in the car, which is what took him so long to get him out. They had to cut the bars around him off and load him on a backboard. But uh, Ricky said that Larry did speak with him. He was moving both arms. He was able to communicate with both his brothers and talk to them. And in, and in Ricky's uh, term, he was awake and alert. They're going to take him to the hospital for some x-rays. And so they are all breathing a major sigh of relief over here, at least in the Pearson family. Well, 
So are we all, Doc. Thanks for that news. It's probably the best news that we could have gotten considering the situation, the way that car was hit right on that driver's side door, and you can see how far it caved in. So, uh, wow, just... Uh, that makes the day a lot better. That was a very, very hard hit. There is no doubt about that. I mean, that car really caved in good. It was great to, great to see Larry uh, you know, hear from his brother that he's talking. Because uh, I, I got to tell you, if I was in that crowd, I'd for sure been knocked out. No doubt about that one. That was a hard, hardest. I think that's probably the hardest hit I've seen in years. Yeah, and we talk about know these kind of things can happen here. And uh, Ricky and Larry Pearson are two guys that I grew up with around the racetrack as kids. We were uh, playing as, I, as our dads were, were racing. So uh, we just wish all the Pearson family and certainly Larry the best here. We're going to step aside uh, one more time. Uh, they are going to restart the race here at Bristol. So stay with us. We're probably going to go over our allotted time, but uh, we'll get the last five in. Back here at Bristol Motor Speedway where our red flag situation continues. Uh, let's update you if you are just tuning in. We've just passed the bottom of the hour uh, with about, f well, officially five laps remaining in this uh, Legends race. A very severe crash involving Charlie Glotzbach slamming into the driver's side door of a spinning Larry Pearson. And uh, we did just before we went to commercial break, that's the remains of uh, Charlie Glotzbach's car, get an update from Dr. Jerry Punch. He talked to uh, Larry Larry's brother. Larry's brother said he was alert, that he uh, was uh, able to talk to him. They are transporting him as we speak to uh, a Johnson City Hospital. If we get further Im information, we will pass it on. Now, we are going to show you this one time in real speed, and uh, we want to warn you that this is a violent crash. So if uh, you've got young ones uh, and you don't want to see it, turn away right now. Larry gets in the corner, just gets a little loose right there, spins, kind of a normal deal. Looks like the left rear tire is down on the car. And then there's where Charlie comes in, right on the driver's side door. And as uh, Dr. Jerry Punch confirmed, uh, he had been knocked unconscious, but uh, did regain consciousness, was talking to his brother when they transported him from here at Bristol Motor Speedway to a local hospital. And there are the remains of what's left of uh, Larry's car as they try and load it on the flatbed. Now let's get an update on uh, Charlie Glotzbach's situation. We saw him walk away from the car. Jamie Little, I think you've got more. Yes, medical just told me that he was knocked unconscious. Now they have loaded him back up in the ambulance. They are transporting him to the local hospital in Bristol as a precaution. Now he did have some cuts on him, but he says he is okay. And as you said, he walked in there. But as for further evaluation, they're going to take him to the hospital. Well, and that's a good move. And uh, obviously that's good news. Thank you, Jamie. And, uh, you know, we just hate to see this. We were having so much fun watching watching these legends out there having a great time just doing laps and, we, and you know sometimes we all forget that you know they're still doing 120 miles an hour yeah we just talked about the speeds and rusty you'd mentioned how fast they were running around here you know and and the one thing that but uh, maybe a couple of things these race cars are are very safe they've built very well maybe they're not up to uh the the same standards as what the cup cars are as far as what the thickness of the roll bars and things have to be uh don't really know that for sure but you can see how that speed uh, automatically caved that in so uh, uh but they did a great job uh, with the building of the cars. and one other thing we don't know rusty is uh, i don't think uh that there were any spotters out there so charlie you know you, people you know you, you have a tendency you can't see through that b that a pillar post when you're in that corner sometimes yeah i hear what you're saying there marty though i can't blame it on not having a spotter though this particular incident looks like larry blew a left rear tire the car went up the racetrack hit the wall and a lot of drivers including myself when i see a driver up against a wall a lot of times i gas it up to go down low to try to outrun the car that's coming across the track now it looks like charlie just kept his same speed and just had nowhere to go at that moment but uh you know I i'm in the same ballpark as dale is these cars are very very safe this is the worst thing you want to see a driver have happen to you get hit in the door but NASCAR, they've done a really good job with the extra foam in between the door and the roll cage, things like that to make that better. All right, so uh, they are finishing the cleanup process here. If we do get more word from the hospital, we will certainly pass it on. We'll take another break and come back to wrap up Saturday Night Showdown.
Back here at Bristol Motor Speedway, the cleanup continues after our red flag situation involving the two-car crash of Charlie Klotzbach and also Larry Pearson. That is David Pearson. That is a live shot uh, of him. He is putting his helmet away. Uh, obviously, he has withdrawn from the race. Uh, five laps remaining, and he is going to uh, head to the hospital. Let's get more from Vince Welch. Well, guys, even before the accident, they were considering bringing David Pearson in because he had grazed the wall a little bit earlier and uh, had knocked the toe out of the car, and it was becoming very difficult to handle. And then once the accident took place, they uh, radioed to David, and David uh, at that point was going to stay in the car until the race finished. But because of the way the car is handling and the situation involving his son Larry, he's decided to go ahead and get out of the car, get, uh, get changed, and get to the hospital. And uh, probably in the uh, best sense of things, the right decision make and that was his youngest son Eddie going in uh, with him there into the area uh, right down there behind pit road and uh, you know uh, certainly understandable I mean if it was Stephen you'd probably be heading for the hospital too no oh, absolutely there's just no doubt about that I mean just like he said though I mean he's a racer but the car is tore up a little bit and there's no reason to keep going out there so let's go to the hospital check on his son looks like your brothers are all heading that way like Dale said and uh, this is something that obviously I would do too. Let's check in now with uh, Dr. Jerry Punch. Well, we are waiting to get this race restarted. We'll visit with one of the all-time legends, Kale Yarborough, sitting here on the wall. Kale and signing, signing autographs and talking to a lot of the fans. Now, i got to ask you about a rumor. I heard a rumor that you called Rick Hendrick and said, if you'll run a fifth car, you'll drive for him full-time. <laughs> I told Rick that uh, at, at the banquet, uh, that if he know if he needed a 70 year old champion that i was ready yeah <laughs> now you came up as a you came to the nascar awards banquet last year right. and we're, we're on the stage when uh, when jimmy tied you winning three in a row right. and you got you got a standing ovation right. yeah and i appreciated that you know uh this this sport has been uh good to me and uh i've been so blessed to be a part of it and you know I would love to be making the kind of money these boys are making today, but I wouldn't take anything, Doc, for having been in this sport in the early days. That was when it was a lot of fun. It was so much fun. And, you know, a lot of people still say today that you are the reason this sport took off in popularity. What happened on that final lap when you got out of the car and, and single-handedly took on the Alabama gang at Daytona when everybody was watching on national television and suddenly the, the ratings took off and people began to come to the racetrack, and that sort of put this sport on the map. It did, and, uh, you know, I would have well, uh, rather won that race that day, but... Uh, it's all right with me if I, if if the Allison boys and I had a big part in making this sport what it is today. Do you have a favorite memory? I mean, you had so many of those three championships, driving for Junior, four Daytona 500s. What stands out in your mind to this day? That's probably one of your most favorite points in the in your career. Uh, there, there are a lot of things that stand out. I think winning the 1968 Southern 500 in Darlington. That's where my racing career started. That's my home track. And that was the last race that ever ran on the old Arlington racetrack. So I won that 1968 race there, and I wouldn't take winning that one for anything in the world. And, you know, I got a pretty good memory here, too, uh, here at Bristol. They had a 500 lap race here, and I led every one of them, so you can't forget that. And I remember them all. Thank you so much for so many great memories and coming back and be a part of this great day with us, Kale. Thank you, Doc. Kale Yarborough. Marty? All right, thanks, Doc. And uh, good news for race fans that, uh, you know, we got the good news as far as uh, Larry's condition. Uh, much better than it could have been. And we have refired the engines when we are getting ready back to go under yellow. We have five laps remaining here with Rick Wilson out in front of Phil Parsons, L.D. Ottinger, Jack Ingram, and Tommy Houston will be in the top five. It looks like uh, Phil's going to need a little bump start. Yeah, it looks like the battery might have died on him right there. And pop this baby off, get it running. There it goes. He'll pull up behind Rick Wilson again, back in the front there. And we did get word that, they, that the teams did have spotters, so uh, we want to update that part of the, the equation. And I think, you know, what you guys had talked about before that break, uh, 
holds up you know yeah and i think you know it, other things that would factor in here you know obviously we talked about the speed and and your reflexes and your sight and art neither one are quite as good so you know things happening quickly it, even with 20 year olds here racing you get involved in things so you know it's even more difficult uh for guys as they get up into to 70 so again we just wish everybody the the very best make the most of the situation rusty this was always difficult for me red flag situation a big crash i can remember sitting here uh i was in the bush race whenever michael waltrip had his horrific accident over off a of turn two but trying to get going again yeah your mind's always thinking about it and your crew's talking to you but right now at this particular point when this happened to me in the past my crew would come across me and say okay shake it off come let's get back in the game now we got six or eight laps to go it's gonna be a shootout we can win this thing they, they would try to flip your mind and change you and get you back on paying attention to the car. And I'm sure that's what they're doing to Rick Wilson, Phil Parsons, and LD Ottinger. These three guys look real strong right now. And this can be a five lap shootout. So, as we get ready to go back to green flag racing, let's check in quickly uh, with uh, Jamie Little, who's got a very happy Justin Allgaier. Well, yes, he just uh, went to victory lane for the first time in the nationwide series. I know we've had some unfortunate circumstances here, but what's it like for you standing here watching all these legends race? Well, the cool part about it is, is these guys, uh, they still love this sport so much, and and growing up watching a lot of them and, and, and being a part of the, the racing for so long, it's just, there's a lot of history on that racetrack right now, and, and unfortunately, we hate the, the, the circumstances the way that they are, but I'm pulling for LD Ottinger. We we actually uh, I drew his uh, his name earlier today, and so we got him to start on the pole. So I'm rooting for him. He's he's, he's close. We're not quite there yet, but it's it's just a good race. I know he was rooting for you. I have to ask, has it sunk in yet? Not really. I, I just told them. They said, what are you going to do after you won? I said, I don't know. What do you do after you win a race in, in Nationwide Series? I, I just. Uh, enjoy this race and, and go hang out with my wife and my family and, and just uh, really try to soak it all in and really enjoy it. True class act, Justin Allgaier, your nationwide winner from today at Bristol. Jamie, tell him it's okay if he sleeps with the trophy tonight. I know a lot of guys have done that after their first win. Let's reset the start for you as we get ready to go back to green flag racing. It'll be Rick Wilson in the 75 right alongside with Phil Parsons in row two, L.D. Ottinger, and then the 11 of Jack Ingram, and then in row three, it's Tommy Houston and Jim Jimmy Hensley in that uh, black quality machine. Well, Phil needs to get a lot better restart this time. He got smoked last time and needs to be on his on his game right now. Oh, there goes Wilson. Boy, and <laughs> wheel spin for Parsons. As soon as the green flag flies, Wilson was on it. Phil trying to come back underneath, and he's got a run on him. Yeah, I think Rick Wilson might have missed going into high gear, though. He got a great start, but uh, he might have not got it all the way in there. They feel a chance on the inside here. There'll be four laps to go this time by. Phil Parsons, your new race leader. Rick Wilson right behind him. L.D. Ottinger in third. And Wilson is driving that car hard. That back end's kicking out, sliding back and forth. I've seen that car loose about four or five times, Dale. This time by, there'll be three laps remaining, and here comes Wilson on the inside. Can he get him going down into one? Does he have enough Whoa. grip on the tires? They're going to run up the hill, and he does. He takes the lead. How about that move? He didn't let that wiggling bother him at all, did he, Russ? Oh, I thought that baby'd spin right out. He was so close to him, and he just kind of brushed against him and kept getting it. And all of a sudden, he pulls away with two laps remaining here at Bristol. L.D. Ottinger trying to reel in the 66 for second spot. And there you get the idea from first, second on back to third. The other three cars are dropping a little bit further back. This time by, there will be one lap remaining. And he is on it right now. In fact, here he is, and we've got... Uh, that was it. Well, that was it. They, they gave the checker flag and before that. Yeah. They snuck a lap out of us. They told us <laughs> they were going to restart with five, and they only did four. If we got so excited, we missed the checkered flag, Marty. <laughs> they tricked us. They tricked us. The uh, last lap of 15 to 86, that would have qualified you about 15th in a nationwide race. That's what Rick Wilson just won. Ran. He was on it that last lap. Well, congratulations to Rick Wilson. Even though we were one lap behind, he was right on time. <laughs> Oh, so second place will go to Phil Parsons and L.D. Ottinger rounds out the top three with Jack Ingram, Tommy Houston, and Jimmy Hensley. The six cars that were still running here at the end of our 35 lap showdown event for our legends. Yeah, what do you think when you run a speed that fast like Rick did? I mean, he's got to get out of the car saying, you know what? I can still do this. That's right. He'll be looking. He'll be trying to get somebody to give him a ride back here in August, won't he? In the nationwide race for that, Absolutely. Saturday, for that Friday night. Those are fast laps. 
And the crowd that has stuck around, and you got to remember, folks, this place holds 160,000. There's probably still about, I would say, 10, 10,000, 20,000 maybe that uh, have stuck uh, around. I, I'd say at least I'm looking down here right now, Marty. I'm guessing about 20 to 25,000, probably no more than that. But there's people spread all around this racetrack. They stayed to watch this race. And uh, it was an exciting one. Unfortunate, we had a big crash, but an exciting race nonetheless. And all we got to do now is get Rick out of the car so we can talk to him. <laughs> Rick's going to enjoy every moment of this. He probably hadn't been in victory lane in a while. As Rick climbs out, he had nationwide series wins here at Bristol back in 89. He won from the pole and Dover that same year. Jamie Little, let's talk to him. Oh, we talked to Rick Wilson after he got his first few laps of practice, and you said it was just like the old days. Sum up this emotion and winning here today. This is unbelievable. I mean, this was just like, uh, you know, years ago. You know, the Food Country gang put me in a car together just like it was back then, you know, and it, it was just unbelievable how good this car was. And, you know, Phil tried me. You know, I mean, he tried me there at the last, and, uh, hey, I didn't mind. Let him go because I knew I could drive right back by him. But, hey, I just want to thank Scott's. I want to thank Bristol Motor Speedway for inviting me here. And, of course, you know, Charlie Henderson, this food country game. Great. They're great. I have to say, you had some of the best starts of the day. What was it like doing those double file restarts? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I mean, especially when you beat them, you know, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great deal. I mean, I mean, everything went good. I love coming back. I just hope to have it again. You're a true legend. Congratulations. Rick Wilson is your winner. Alan. All right, Jamie, thanks. So Rick Wilson celebrating uh, his victory here at Bristol Motor Speedway and a look at the final results of the Saturday night showdown at Bristol. Wilson and Parsons pretty much ran one and two for uh, the, the latter three quarters of the race. And you see the rest of the finishing order with the 12 drivers who started in today's event. A couple of updates on some upcoming motorsports programming here on the ESPN networks. Uh, it is going to be NASCAR Now pre-race edition before the Sprint Cup race here at Bristol tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Eastern time. Rusty going to be among those from here at the racetrack. NHRA four and wide from Charlotte next Saturday and Sunday qualifying and finals on ESPN2. And uh, Eyes on IndyCar Series coverage is on ABC. That's next Sunday from St. Petersburg, Florida. And the NASCAR Nationwide Series off next weekend. Our coverage resumes here on ESPN at uh, Nashville, Tennessee. Two weeks from today, next is the World's Strongest Man here on ESPN2. Updates on Larry Pearson and Charlie Glotchback. Stay tuned for those on our motorsports programming. And uh, our thoughts are certainly with them. Rick Wilson, winner of the Saturday Night Shootout at Bristol 2010.